Have a seat. Well, let me just uh, read something to you, just to kind of give you an introduction of how, what we're going to do today. This is out of a book that actually my wife uh, gave to me, and it says that there are moments in history when a door for massive change opens, a great revolutions for good or for evil occur in a vacuum created by these openings. It is in these times that key men and women and entire generations risk everything to become the hinge of history the pivotal point to determine which way the door will swing. Well, I just want to welcome everybody here to Lifehouse Church. Any guests that are here, it's good to have you here in our uh, smaller uh, arena right now. And uh, as we're building the other uh, expansion that you saw when you walked in uh, this week, uh, and then for the next couple weeks, we're going to do something kind of interesting here that goes along with this whole door idea. Um, we're doing this thing called a turbo service, but we're, I'm kind of calling it the revolving door. And what happens here is there's going to be three people that are going to share today. They're going to have three questions that they're going to answer, and they got three minutes to answer each question. So, of course, if you add that up, each person gets nine minutes, and then there's going to be like a revolving door to where they're going to be literally pulled off stage if they're not done. And uh, the next person is going to come up, and uh, they're going to go ahead and share. And this week, what, we're, what you're going to look at is you're going to look at, uh, get to hear from the full-time staff here at Lifehouse Church. Um, you're going to be hearing from Ryan, from myself, from my wife, and uh, we're going to be looking at key moments that uh, have taken place in our life and key people that have influenced our lives to help the door in our life swing the right direction so that uh, it leads to understanding of what God wants to do, not only in our lives, but here at Lifehouse Church. The questions that we're going to be answering this week is, uh, number one, uh, we're going to be looking at a Bible character, all right? I shouldn't even say a character because these are real people. It's not a story in the Bible. This is history, all right? But people within the Bible that have uh, meaning in your life, that have influenced your life. Number two, we're going to look at a real person, okay, in our life uh, as we've lived uh, about how they influenced our life. And the third question we're going to look at is a principle or principles uh, that we are trying to learn to live by as we are going through life. So again, the first person that's going to walk through this imaginary revolving door that we have up here is going to be our worship leader and ministry director, Ryan Fellows, uh, followed by my wife, uh, our children's pastor uh, and our administrator. And then yours truly is somehow going to try to figure out how to do this in nine minutes, all right? So hopefully my wife will run short so I can have a couple of her minutes, but... Uh, uh, as time, now, you'll, you're going to see a, a countdown behind us, and as time begins to run out, you're, you're welcome when we get down to 10 seconds to start doing the countdown, so we know, all right, we're running out of time, and, and we need to, to finish up to get off the, off the stage, and if, if we're not done, we've just got to stop where we're at and walk off the stage, okay, so that's, that's the rules, so that's what's going to happen this week, next week we're going to kind of have a continuation of that with, uh, with three new people, so with that said, we're going to open the revolving door and let the first person in. Uh, uh, Ryan Fellows. All right. I hope this is on. <clears throat> Starting my timer. Okay, what I want you guys to do is to help me out. When we get to six minutes and three minutes, everybody just do one clap like this. Can we just try it? One, two, three, go. Good. So I'll know when I'm at six minutes and then three minutes, okay? That'll help me out and keep me on task here this morning. So the first question that we're talking about is uh, <clears throat> name a Bible person that has influenced your life. And, uh, you know, I just had this thought. I know the Ellis says you guys have been here first service. Anyone else here first service? Okay. So this is going to be interesting because you can hear the same thing. So hopefully get uh, – that's just a little bit intimidating to hear, to have the same people here. Anyway, back on task is that – uh, the Bible is filled with people who have very real lives. Would you agree with that? These aren't just historical figures that, you know, we read about. They were actually real people who served God. And you could say that, uh, you know, any one of us could have just as well had our lives put in the Bible for everyone to read. And that's kind of a, a sobering thought. But um, the person that has influenced my life, one of the persons that has influenced my life is Joseph. And, of course, I'm sure a lot of us have heard uh, the story of Joseph and the coat of many colors. They've done Broadway productions about him and, and, uh, and whatnot. I just want to talk about what, what he, how he's influenced my life, and here are, are several ways. First is that good news to you doesn't necessarily mean good news to everybody else. Um, isn't that true? Because in his life, he obviously had good news because he 
you know, he was favored by his father, had the, the code, of course, his brothers didn't like him, but he got, he received a vision from the father. He received a vision for what his life, what he was going to do with his life, and, and what God had in store for his life, which was great news to him, but he shared that good news with his brothers who didn't see that as good news, did they? And so, um, just kind of the first thing that, that I get from that is, man, I, I feel like there's times where maybe we hear something, we're excited about something, passionate about something that God has shown us, and, uh, Maybe it's not the right, t- maybe it's not the right time, uh, or place to show or to to re- to tell other people uh, what you what you've learned. Um, <laughs> that was awesome. Uh, <laughs> um, the second thing is this: that hearing and believing you have a great destiny, um, or in other words, God has a great plan for your life, doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen in autopilot mode or in the way that you think it should, right? Uh, of course, his life, he had this vision, this dream, and that didn't happen exactly how he thought it should or thought it would. And, uh, you know, just kind of in my life, I grew up thinking about or just being told, I guess, man, God has a great plan for your life, Ryan. You're going to do this and you're going to do that. And I, I had a dream for my own life and, and just, you know, I have great expectations for what God is going to do and he's going to use me and all this. But I guarantee if you're feeling that same way this morning, Thank you. If you're feeling that, oh, that was awesome. You guys should, we're doing choir maybe eventually someday, so we need, to, need you. If you guys feel that same way that, uh, man, God has a great thing for my life, I don't think it's going to happen by us just sitting on our hands and waiting for that to drop on our lives. We have to be responsible with the gifts that he's given us and with the, uh, the vision that he's placed inside of our lives. And again, it doesn't happen in the way that we think it should happen or in the time, timing that we think it should happen. Uh, because in Joseph's case, of course, you know, we read in the Bible that, you know, we can read through that whole story in like 10 minutes. Well, his life didn't happen in 10 minutes. There was time between being uh, given that coat and between being sold and then thrown in prison and then promoted to uh, prime minister. Okay, there was time that happened between those things. And so in our lives, the, the shortest of distance between now and what God has for us isn't always uh, this short, easy path. You understand what I'm saying? All right. Number two, moving on to this, the next thing. Name a person in your life. That's influenced your life. Um, there are a lot of people, but I think <clears throat> this is something that we all have in common is that, that our, our father, our dad, my dad has influenced my life probably more than anyone else. And your dad has influence in your life, whether you uh, realize it or not, whether you believe it or not. Um, good influence and negative influence. Dads have so much influence, right? You just think about your life and think about what. Uh, how you carry yourself now. Maybe you, you grew up with a father who wasn't really, who didn't acknowledge you or what you accomplished, and so that now you just, you know, kind of found yourself to be a person who, who seeks approval everywhere you go, and you seek approval from, from people, and, and, uh, and that's shaped your life, you know, wouldn't you say? Uh, maybe your dad communicated to you that he believes in you, and that he, uh, he values you, and he, he, he says, man, you can do this. You have what it takes. And so that's giving you confidence in all things. And, you know, just in my life, how my dad has influenced me, my dad dreams big. He sees the big picture. He, you know, he's kind of a uh, <clears throat> go for it kind of a person. Go big or stay home is kind of his motto. Every time we go shopping, he, that was his mentality. We're going to spend a lot or we're not going to spend anything. There's no, there's no in between. We're going we're gonna to go for it. And, um, just the idea that, man, you guys can, can go for things. You can go big. And he believed in my brothers and I. I have three brothers, so the four of us. He believed in us that, that we should go after the, the calling that God has specifically for our lives and not the desire that, that he has for our lives. And my dad's a farmer. Uh, of course, like I said, I have three brothers. None of us uh, want to walk into that same, um, same uh, field of work. Uh, no pun intended. He... Uh, so he's been very, um, <clears throat> what do I want to say? Um, he lets us go after what, what he believes God is calling us to do. All right. Uh, the other thing is that he is just so optimistic, and I, feel, I believe that's influenced my life. I kind of see things as, as being half full. The glass is half full. There's always positive things we can get from this. Um, <clears throat> let's, things will work out. We can make this happen. Um, and maybe, maybe to the fault of, of, being, of, of taking on too many things. That's kind of how he, he's influenced my life. It's not a positive thing. I have a lot of irons in the fire. I'm just all about, let's, let's just add one more thing. And, you know, I'm trying to balance this. And, and, uh, but, I, but I'm just optimistic and go for it, right? Dream big.
But I think the most important thing that he's influenced my life is that he, he believes in doing what's right. He hasn't necessarily proven that in his life, but he's, he's uh, promoted that in our lives of, of be men of integrity. Do what is uh, important. Do what matters. Do what's right. And, um, man, I love my dad. So that's how he's influenced me. Last uh, thing I want to talk about, last question, explain a principle that you're l- learning to live by. Um, of course, three months ago maybe or a year ago, I would say that God is now, right? Who's heard me talk about God is now? The nowness of God, connecting with God moment by moment by moment by moment by moment by moment by moment. That he is now and now and now and now and now. And he is. And he's wanting to speak to us now and now and now and now. And so that's been a principle that I've been going after, going after hard. But the last few months, it's kind of shifted to this focus in my life. And and that is the obedience to the commands of God. and, And serving him the way that he wants to be served, not the way that I think he wants to be served. But truly seeking out, God, if I'm going to follow you, if I'm going to obey you, what does that actually look like, and how can I do that? And I'm reminded of, of Saul in uh, 1 Samuel 15, where, where uh, Samuel the prophet goes to Saul and says, this is what the Lord's saying, go and wipe these people out, because they've, uh, they've gone against God's people. And so S- Saul takes his, uh, his army, goes in, and does, uh, obeys the commands of the Lord, except that he, he, uh, he spares the king. And he also uh, gathers all the fatted livestock, which he was instructed not to. And he gathers all this stuff together. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, and then uh, Samuel says, look, you, you've disobeyed the commands of the Lord. And, and Saul says, well, look, I've, I've done these things so I can sacrifice them to the Lord. And so he was saying, I've done these things. I've obeyed. M- maybe I've gone outside the lines a little bit, but I've done so with good intentions because I'm serving him. And, and Samuel says this, that, that, the Lord, that, that obedience is better than sacrifice. And so it's all about doing what God says. And my challenge is that we investigate what God desires from us and do His will. Don't change it. And we just trust and obey and follow Him in that. Um, wow. So here's, here's a, some, a thought that we have, right? God sees my heart, and He does see our hearts as we're obeying Him. Um, but the heart is deceitful above all things, isn't it? Your heart can deceive you. And so it's all about trusting in Him and obeying in Him and following His commands. Amen? Amen. <laughs>
that is opening, doors that are opening. And sometimes those doors are planned by us, and sometimes those doors open without us initiating it or causing that to happen or for it to open without us even wanting it to happen. And when that door does open, that change, the possibility for good and evil will take place. And this author, he was explaining how people become the hinges to that door of change. And hinges are the little gadget. I tried to get Kevin to bring me a hinge and no can do. But anyway, I think you all probably know what a hinge is. It's those little devices that determine which way the door will swing. So again, hinges determine which way the door will swing and what comes along once that door is opened. So the person that I was thinking about, um, I mean, how's, how do you narrow down which person in the Bible has taught you the most? Because we should learn from all of them. But in thinking of a hinge of history, I thought of John the Baptist. And um, I believe that John was a, part, was, a, was a part of a huge change, and that change was going to be um, a great change in the lives of many people because he was the messenger that came before Jesus started his ministry. And he was, uh, well, let me read what it says in Mark. It says, In the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God, it is written in Isaiah the prophet, I will send my mess." No, don't do that to me. That messes me up. Thanks, Ryan. Uh, I will send my messenger ahead of you. You will pre <laughs> who will prepare your way. See, I mess me up. A voice of one calling in the desert. Prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight paths for him. And that scripture hit me several months ago. I remember sharing that with somebody, thinking, that's a powerful scripture. Anyway, John the Baptist, he'd been living in the desert. And I believe while he was living in the desert, I think he was preparing the way in himself. And um, I'm not ex exactly sure, but from what I've read, he probably didn't have his parents for the majority of his life because his parents were very old when they had him. And um, so he, the other thing about John the Baptist, he wasn't concerned about the latest fashion and trends and whether he wore expensive clothes. It says he wore camel hair and, and a leather belt. He didn't um, have the choicest of food because he ate what? Locusts and honey. Yuck. Which the Wheeland son would like. Um, anyway, he stayed on course and John the Baptist didn't forget his mission regardless of the people around. So as a hinge, he could have, John the Baptist, could have had the door swing the other direction than what he did. He could have become envious because people had started to going, started going to Jesus. His disciples even went to him and said, hey, John, people are starting to go to Jesus instead of you. And uh, after all, you know, he'd been teaching and preaching to these people before Jesus had even come into the picture. And uh, people were following him. He could have demanded equality with Jesus because uh, people were listening to him. People were following him. But he determined that the door of this change would swing in a way where God's goodness was to take place and would be seen. And he knew his role was to be a messenger. He sent he was sent to get people ready for the ministry of Jesus. And he pointed to Jesus. He didn't point to himself. He, in fact, said he must increase, meaning Jesus Jesus must increase and I must decrease. So Mark 1, 3, the scripture that really hit me was prepare the way, make straight the paths for him. And through the scripture that I think it's telling me and in all of us that we are to prepare the way. When I think of the word prepare, it doesn't mean just sitting around, kind of vegging out, going about my own business, but it's doing something. It's being active and it's being on a mission. And uh, I need to be preparing, actively getting ready by seeking the heart of God and by doing his will. And, you know, I think of preparing how when if we're having company, preparing for me is not an easy thing. And everybody in the house can tell when I'm preparing for company. It's tough. Preparing's not an easy thing. But he's telling us, prepare, be active, be doing and um, in our hearts and making the straight, making straight the paths for him. And I think that means that Obviously, we have some unstraight or crooked paths in our lives, and that means cleaning up anything within my heart, anything within my mind that is not true, that is not right, and that does not glorify God. It means ridding myself of anything that he views as unholy and displeasing. It means purifying my heart. It means being wholly devoted to him. It's submitting my life to Christ and making him, as we sang about today, my everything. And so he's asking me, he's asking you to prepare for him. And what are we to prepare for? To prepare to experience him, to experience his life, our life filled with purpose, with his purposes. It's to prepare for him, uh, for the work of his spirit to move in my life and to work through my life. It's preparing for him so that I can experience his comfort, his hope, his power, his guidance, his protection, his peace, and ultimately 
eternal life. And the scripture, if we take it to heart and apply it, then we are assured that we are a hinge determining God's goodness to take place when changes in our life occur. So I'm wanting to be a hinge that swings the door of of change for God's good because his ways are good. His ways are perfect and right. And when my life uh, when my life is at it, where my life is now and where my life is headed has everything to do with the direction that I determine the door of change will swing. He doesn't want you and I to stay the same. He's wanting us, as the word says, to go from glory to glory, which means blessedness of the soul. That's an awesome promise that he's wanting us to experience. And I believe, as I was thinking about all of this and just how it all was fitting in and how my husband was saying, let's do kind of the door theme. And this was before we'd even talked about any of this, but I was thinking of the expansion and how, would you not agree that the expansion is a door of change at Lifehouse Church? I think it's huge. And I believe that you and I are the hinges that will determine the way the door will swing in this change at Lifehouse. You and I will determine if this change is going to bring about the goodness of who God is, about the goodness for the sake of Christ. And just as God had called John the Baptist to be a messenger sent to prepare uh, the way for Jesus, I believe that you and I need to apply this message into our own lives, and then we in turn become the messenger. John the Baptist prepared in the desert, and then he came and he prepared the way for people and shared that message to them. So we are messengers. So as messengers, we must be prepared ourselves in order to prepare the way for others to experience God's power, to experience his love, and we must make our own path straight. And that means making those crooked, unstraight, unhealthy, ungodly paths straight. And so the person, you know, is thinking about who has impacted me the most. It is hard. And um, I guess I'm thinking of a group of people, intercessors, men and women who intercede. Um, If you don't know what an intercessor is, they are humble people. They're not self-driven. They seek God's heart, and they want the deeper things of God. They want to hear from God, and they pray what he wants. They stand in the gap for others, and they bear others' burdens. They are hinges of history. And they play a big role here at Lifehouse and in my life. And I think of growing up a man named Dennis Tyson, who as a teenager, I can't tell you the number of times he said, I'm praying for you. And that influenced me to be a hinge of history. Ha! Um, question number one, name a Bible person that has influenced my life. And again, when I, when I think of this whole Bible and who's influenced my life the most, it's kind of anybody, you ever go to Cold Stone ice cream over in Grand Island? I mean, can you walk in that place and say, that's my favorite kind of ice cream? I mean, you can't because it's just all mushed together and everything. Yeah, everybody says, yeah, but uh, usually I'm an ice cream connoisseur, but, uh, over there, it just all runs together. There's no way. And when you get in the Bible, there is no way you can look and say, this is my favorite person because it, it just depends on what kind of mood you're in, all right? So as you look in the Bible, of course, Jesus, he epitomizes all godliness. And you would like to say Jesus, but if we got to throw Jesus out because everybody should say Jesus, okay? Who's the next person? The one that comes to my mind this week, okay, with the mood I was in is, is King David, all right? And even before he was King David, And the reason that I love King David is because the label that God has placed upon his life. Remember what he's called? A man after what? God's own heart. And I'll tell you what, at the end of my life, if when I stand before God, if God would give me that title, that would be awesome. Wouldn't you love to have that title by God? That you are a man after God's own heart. And that is that is what would that's just really what should drive all of us is God, let me be after your own heart. I mean, David, incredible man. Here's the deal with David. He was, had a humble background, didn't he? He's a shepherd boy born into a lower class uh, family, uh, brother of eight sons that we know of. His dad didn't even look at David as, as somebody that was, was even a potential for the king. When Samuel came and Jesse looked and said, bring the seven here and leave David on the hill because he can't be one of them. And Sam said, it's not any of these seven, these good-looking boys. It's not any of these because God isn't looking at, at the outward appearance. He's looking within the heart. Bring David down here. So, again, we see this humble background that takes place. And I don't know about you, but I think I can relate to that, okay? Because I don't think anybody that goes to Lifehouse Church is part of royalty, uh, is a leader, and you have kingdoms and all that kind of stuff. So I think we can look at David and really apply that to our life. Wow, what would that be like if God called any single one of us and said, you're the king now or whatever, or you're the 
queen or whatever. It would be a very humble thing, and I think that's what we've got to do uh, is, is keep ourselves humble. That's what David did, and I think that's why the next point with David that I love about him is it created him to be such an authentic worshiper of God because, again, he looked at his life in the backdrop of this humility that he came out of, and he began to worship God, giving God all the credit, and, again, he didn't care what others thought of him. Okay, he only cared what God thought of him when he was worshiping God, right? And again, that's how I want to live my life. I don't really care what anybody thinks. I don't, sorry to say this, but I don't care what you guys think. Okay? I'm going to worship God, and if you guys think I'm weird for being down here and sitting on my knees or whatever before, I don't really care. Okay? I want to go after God, okay? And I'm not saying you've got to do that to, you know, David's, here's David. He, he's out before the Ark of the Covenant, jumping around, dancing around in his pajamas, all right? I mean, he's humbling himself before God. His, his wife, Michelle, looks at him and says, is that any type of activity for a king? And he says, you know what, Michelle? I don't really care what you think, and I don't care what all these people think. And this is what he said. He says, I'm even going to become even more undignified before my God as I'm worshiping. I'm going to humble myself before my God. And I think that's a great lesson for every single one of us to, to understand. If you want to be a man after God's own heart or a woman after God's own heart, quit looking around of what the world's thinking about you and go after God, worship him with all transparency. And that's what I love about David because here's the, the fact is this. David was a powerful leader. He had a huge kingdom. If anybody had the opportunity to be prideful, to be arrogant, okay, it was David, right? But did his heart remain soft before God? Are you guys with me? It was always soft before God. That's what every single one of us has to live our life by, is keep your heart soft before God. And that's a key lesson that I learned from David. Gaining favor with God is living a life that's sustaining and humility before God in every bit of your praise. Every bit of your success has to be deflected back to God, and that's what I love about David so much. Question number two. Okay, what's the person that's influenced my life the most in, in, during my lifetime? And again, many people have done that. Many people that I don't really even know from books and resources and conferences. I look at Bill McCartney with Promise Keepers and Bill Hybels and his vision casting and Robert Morris's teaching. We got, you know, Perry Stone, John Bevere, Dick Ruby. You can, you can go down the list. And so many people have has added to uh, what, what, how, how I am as a Bible teacher. But the people that I know, I, I think of people that have shaped me. I think of, uh, uh, if you, any of you remember Solomon Wong that used to pastor here at, uh, at uh, North Shore, um, huge vision. He, you know, took some of us to India and showed us really what, uh, what big vision is. I think of Dale Phillips and David Zock, a couple of our overseers that mean so much. I, I think of Brian Young. I mean, the, the teaching that he has imparted upon me is uh, not just he has, but he's, he's, you know, this understanding of this Jewish understanding and everything. Thing, and it's really changed my life and my understanding of Scripture. So I, I think of him and, and uh, appreciate what he's done in my life. But as I go through the different people and look at what I do as leading a church, pastoring, the person that I look at the most that I go, man, I really want to model my life after that, it's my former pastor, Doby Weasel. And if you know Doby, okay, uh, from Omaha, he's a man that is just a tremendous preacher. He's a tremendous leader. He has this anointing. If you're ever around people that just has a strong anointing on them, you just know it, okay? You can just be around them going, whoa. And this is a man that has that type of anointing. And I, I walk around going, man, someday, God, I just continue to impart that, that type of anointing upon me, and I'm far from that yet. But here's the thing that I want you to understand is you can't be close to somebody, okay, without uh, beginning to become more and more like them. You guys know what I mean? Okay, it's uh, the Bible would kind of refer to it as a, like a transfer of anointing from from leader to people. We see this with like Paul to Timothy. We see this with Elijah to Elisha. Okay, the people that you hang around are who you're going to become. And as I was exposed to Doby's leadership and his passion for preaching and teaching and leading, that passion began to be imparted upon me. And then later as I hung around him more and more, that gift of preaching and leading started to be imparted more and more and more upon my life. And this is, again, what I want you guys to all understand is the bottom line is this with people and, and who you're around, okay? You have got to be so cautious with the people that you hang around because, again, those who you are closest to are who you're going to become. So every single one of us, we've got to examine our life. We've got to look at our life and say, who am I hanging around? And those people that you're 
great friends with and everything, are they, when you look at their life, are you looking going, man, I hope my life can become more like that? Okay, or are you looking at those people going, yeah, they're, they're really going down the wrong path. You know what? Then stop being best friends with them because those habits are going to be imparted upon your life. Hang around godly people that are going after God, that has an anointing of God. Those are the people that are going to impart the things that are going to bring favor upon your life. So again, 1 Corinthians 15, 33 says, do not be deceived. And by the way, it says, do not be deceived. All right? The bad thing about deception is it's so deceiving. All right? So you've got to be careful. But it says, evil company corrupts good habits. If you want the favor of God, don't be corrupted by evil company. But we need to fellowship with those people that have godly habits because those habits will be transferred upon your life. And that's what I want for everybody here, to have godly habits because the favor of God will be upon you. Question number three. Where am I at? Whoa, okay. Okay, skip number one. Keep good company. That was number one. Number two, keep godly vision. Okay, let your godly vision be the thing that anchors your life, directing your life. We see Paul going through that. Everybody's coming against Paul. Stands before King Agrippa. Agrippa not disobedient to the heavenly vision. He's looked at him and says, you know what? God gave me a vision, and I'm not departing from that. Even though I'm, I'm not a popular person, I'm still going after what God has called me to do. And that's what we've got to do is attempt to follow God. When God puts a vision in your life, don't depart from it. Let that be the driving factor in your life. Okay, and I'm going to have to skip number three. Number four is this, all right? Number four goes back to this whole thing. Remain humble. Man, I want to remain humble. Philippians 2, verse 3 says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but lowliness of mind. Let each esteem each other better than himself. Let each one of you look out not only for your own interests, but for the interests of others. All right? So stay humble. All right? And i got to stop right there. Okay. In closing, and this isn't part of my speech, all right? This is closing the service, all right? So I, I, I did it, all right? I don't know how I did it. I did it. Okay? Let us all stand up and pray. Can we do that? And I'm going to call the worship team to come forward. Whew, usually I talk fast, but uh, that, was, that was turbo fast, all right? That's why it's called a turbo service, all right? Would you bow your heads with me? Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I just uh, I want to thank you so much for the people within this fellowship, God. And there's so many people here that have so much to offer. There's so many people, God, that I know are going after you, God, that they are truly that hinge, God, that's opening up the door for more and more of your presence, God. And that's what we want here. So, Father, I pray today, even as we have sped up this service, God, this turbo service, I pray, God, that whatever was shared, God, that has come from you, let it not go void, but let it be in the hearts of people, oh God. And every time we come together, I pray, God, your presence would change the lives of every person in this place. Let us not be the same as we walk out of this room, but God, let us be more and more challenged to your vision in our life, and let us not part from that, oh God. We love you. We thank you so much that you live inside of us, directing us. So, Father, we just take one last time here, God, as we depart, just to worship you and to praise you and thank you for who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.